Um, good morning, my name is David Pranga. I'm one of the pastors here at Brewster Baptist Church. Pastor Doug and Jill are gone. They are in um, just outside of Philadelphia. Their future daughter-in-law was graduating from college, so they were meeting the family and getting together with their family and friends, so they'll be back next week. Um, this morning, I'm excited because we have some baptisms after um, the sermon, let's say that. And then next week, we're going to have four more baptisms. And then the following week, we're going to introduce 21 people to Brewster Baptist Church. They've gone through the membership class, and they want to become members. So we have some exciting things that are happening in the next few weeks in our services. So in order to become a member at Brewster Baptist Church, you have to go through the membership class. And what we do in the membership class, for those that are new, we kind of revamped it about a year ago, two years ago, is that we make it a one-night event where we go through, we have pizza, and then we go about what we believe, and we share about our doctrines and about our church. And then we have a follow-up session, which is what we call kind of an interviewing time, where we get together with groups of like four to eight people. And we talk and we answer questions. But the one thing that is my favorite part of this session is I ask the people to tell us about your story. And when I'm talking about your story, what I'm referring to is, when have you encountered Jesus? When was it in your life that Jesus made a difference in your life? And when I ask that question, let me tell you, the room becomes quiet. And I think some people are panicking because they're not sure, what does that really mean? And for some other people, they're saying, you know what? I cannot wait to share my story. And then there's others that basically, they're unsure about everything. And I always tell the group, I'm going to go first. It only has to be two or three minutes. But what I want you to do is I want to share. I want you to share about when you encountered Jesus. When did it become important to you? When did it matter? And what's amazing to me is that we will go around the entire room and without anybody taking any notes, or writing anything down, and people will share their story about when Jesus was important to them. And when people shared, let me tell you, it's the most refreshing, encouraging time that you can believe. Because we lift up Jesus, and we see how he was important in our life. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning, is what is your story? What is your spiritual story? And that's the subject of our message this morning. Currently, we're in the book of Acts. And we're going through the book of Acts. Acts is our book of the month, and we're encouraging you to read through the book of Acts. And I'm going to kind of give you a summary of what's been going on in the book of Acts. It's about the early church. And about the early church, the early church is growing in numbers. It's multiplying. Great things are happening. The disciples are doing miracles. They're healing people, and crowds are gathering to hear the good news about what the disciples had to say. And people are putting their faith in Jesus Christ. They're putting their hope in Jesus Christ. But yet, at the same time that all this good stuff is going on, the early church is facing persecution, and it's facing opposition. Because there is a group of people that don't want to see Christianity move forward. And they're the religious people of the day. Many of us may know these religious people as the Pharisees, or the Sadducees, or a high priest. And all they want to do is they want to shut down what they set called the way, the people that are followers of Jesus. They would have the people arrested. They would have the people put in prison. Some would have be flogged, and others would die because of their faith. But did that stop the disciples from sharing their faith? Not at all. In fact, not only did the disciples keep sharing their faith, but the recent converts, the people that put their faith, went from house to house sharing the good news about what Jesus has done for them. But in Acts, we meet a young man named Saul in chapter 7 and 8, And we're going to be studying about Saul in chapter 9. But I want to give you a little background about who Saul is. Saul is just a young man. He's a Jew. He's a rabbi. He wants to follow the law. He's very zealous for his faith. And Saul's major purpose and mission as a young man is to put an end to the Christian faith. He wanted to destroy the early church. 
He was there when Stephen was stoned, and he gave his approval. He went to the high court and asked them, you know what, can I lock people up and put them in prison if they believed in Jesus? And the high court said, sure, go ahead. And so he would travel around putting Christians in prison. That was his mission. And then we come to chapter 9, and we see a conversion story of Saul. And I want to read to you chapter 9, verses 1 through 23. It's quite lengthy, I will tell you. But look at what happened to Saul's life when he encountered Jesus. So if you're of your Bible, or if you want to look at this screen, let me read to you chapter 9, verses 1 through 23. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest, and he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found anyone there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And as he neared Damascus, on his journey, a sudden light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground, and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. And Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by hand into Damascus. And for three days he was blind. He did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. And the Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on State Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who called on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, because this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And then Ananias went to the house and entered it. And placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me, so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales from the Saul's eyes. And he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. And Saul spent several days with his disciples in Damascus. And at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. And all those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who called on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners, the chief priest? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful, and he baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. See, when I read the story of Acts, and I get to this part on Saul, I'm amazed. Because we see a miracle. We see a conversion. We see someone that is so far from God that he's punishing Christ followers. And then God and Jesus enters his life. And we see a transformation take place where now he's proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. And when I was pondering this story, it made me think about what, is the, what are some things that I could share with you this morning? And three thoughts came to my mind that I really want to share with you. And the first thought is that God never gives up on people, including you. God never gives up on people, including you. Have you ever felt like that God just simply couldn't love you? You know the things in your life that you've done wrong. 
You know the times where you have turned your back on God. Have you ever thought to yourself, man, there's just no way that God can forgive me or that God would even care about me? I've disappointed him in so many times. And the reality is, is that I think most of us, if not all of us, have had those thoughts in our mind or those struggles. And I promise you, you're not alone. I talk to people on a constant basis that just says, you know what, there's just no way that God can forgive me for what I've done in my life. Well, as I go back to chapter 9, verses 1, let me just read you again what happened to Saul. It said, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. See, Saul was locking up Christians who were believing in Jesus, who were sharing their faith with others. Yet God didn't give up on Saul. Even when Saul was persecuting the early Christian church, God didn't give up on him. And God kept on pursuing him, and pursuing him, and pursuing him. Despite Saul's actions, God had a great love for his people. The question that was percolating in my mind this week was, why does God pursue people that on the surface would be the last people that you and I would ever expect to accept Jesus? See, I can see God caring for those that, you know, worship him, and I can see God caring for those that are just the average people that go through life, but why would God still care about the people that are out to destroy Christianity? And maybe make fun of it, or that says, you know what, there's no way that Jesus could exist. But yet we see a God, and we worship a God that loves the unlovable. We worship a God that loves the people that even persecute Christians. Because God cares for each and every single one of us. He truly does. He loves his people. And sometimes we forget how much God loves us. Because not only in the scripture do we see that God loves Saul, but God loves each and every one of us. And he gives us chances. A second chance, a third chance, and a fourth chance. Let me tell you, when I read through the Bible, I see so many people that have messed up, but God still loves them. And God still forgives them. And when I look at the people in the Bible, I look at Abraham. And Abraham was a liar. He forgot God's promises and he tried to do everything on his own will and failed miserably. But God still worked through Abraham. God worked through Moses, who had a bad temper, who lied and murdered a person, and he still used Moses. You go to King David, he murdered and committed adultery. Jonah, he gave a special message, and Jonah runs away from the message and wants to get as far away from God as possible. But God doesn't give up on Jonah, and he uses Jonah to save Nineveh. And then we look at the apostle Peter. He denies Jesus three times. He cuts off a Roman soldier's ear. And Jesus says, I forgive you. And he uses Peter to become the anchor of the church. See, the list can go on and on because the Bible are filled with messed up individuals, just like you and me. But God still loves us. And God still forgives us of our sins. It reminds me of Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9. It says, For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourself. It's a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. See, God gives his gift of grace and forgiveness to Saul. And God gives his grace and forgiveness gift to you as well. See, God's willing to forgive your past. And even though you may feel like God can't forgive you, I promise you that throughout the Scriptures, we see that God is a forgiving God. And what God wants us to do is come to him and to acknowledge our sin and to turn and put our trust in him. So the first point that I really see in this passage is simply that God never gives up on people. And that includes every single person that sits here today. The second thought that came to my 
mind when I was reading this passage is simply, each of us has a story. In Acts 9, we see Saul's conversion story. He goes from persecuting Christians to proclaiming the good news of who Jesus Christ is. He's simply the Messiah. And to help us to learn how to tell our story, there's three questions that I typically ask people to share, to tell their story. The first one is that life begins, life before Jesus Christ. When did Jesus become real to you? And how has your life changed? How has your life been transformed because you meant Jesus Christ? And these three questions help us to share our story with someone that maybe asks us. And we look back to Paul, or look back to Saul. Saul, who was he before he met Jesus? He was simply a rabbi. He was a teacher of the law. He was a Jew by birth, but he was a Gentile by citizenship. He was well-versed in Greek philosophy and Roman law. And his main responsibility, his mission in life at that time was to put a stop to the early church. And we move on to the second question is, when did Jesus become real to Saul? And we see this in the first part of chapter 9, verses 3 through 6. Saul's conversion story is pretty simple, pretty extraordinary. This doesn't happen to most of us at all. But this is how touching it was for Saul, and I believe it had to be this way for him to carry out his mission. But simply, Saul was on his way to Damascus, and a bright light flashed before him from heaven. It knocked him to the ground. And Saul heard this voice, this simple voice that said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul's response, he says, Lord, who are you? And the voice says, Jesus, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. Now get up and go to the city and you will be told what to do. And Saul got up and he was led to the city. He was blind and he fasted for three days and he waited for Ananias to come. Can you imagine if you were Saul what it must have been like to have an encounter, a, basically a physical encounter hearing the audible voice of Jesus? Most of us will never realize what that's like. But I believe each of us we have a story, we have an encounter that we have with God. And the third question is, how has your life changed? See, once you encounter Jesus Christ, you can never stay the same. You can never stay the same. And when Jesus touched Saul's life, his mission changed. His mission changed from persecuting Christians to sharing the good news that Jesus is truly the Messiah, that Jesus is God's Son, and that we have to put our faith in Jesus. That's what happened to Saul. That is Saul's story. Well, in part of our membership class, we asked people, tell us your story. And so I asked the people that were getting baptized, I said, you know what, could you do me a favor this week? Could you come in and can we video videotape your story for the congregation? And the first person I asked was Ron, and Ron was like, he's been walking with the Lord, let's say, for 60 days. 60 days, and he says, I wanted to do this. I would love to do this because God has touched my life so much. The second person I talked to was Justin. Justin's going to get baptized after the sermon. And Justin said, it would be an honor to share my story about what Jesus did in my life. And the third person I called was Linda, and she's going to get baptized at 930. And I'm really, I'll be honest, I had really no faith that Linda was going to tell her story. She's very introvert. She's very shy. And so one day goes by, no return phone call. Second day goes by, and she writes me an email saying, you know what? I know this would be hard for me, but Jesus touched my life. And if you can use my story, that would be great. So this morning, we're going to have a share with you three stories of both Ron, Justin, and Linda about their encounter with Jesus. It's going to be about five minutes in length, so let's watch the screen. Hi, my name's Ron Stranger. All of my life I've battled 
with drug addiction, depression, and loneliness, as well as low self-esteem. I've struggled with suicide as well. It has been a hard life. I've had many ups and downs in life, and I felt an emptiness inside of me. On February 22nd, 2017, I took my friend to Teen Challenge in Brockton. I was going for my friend, but I found out that I needed it more than him. That's where I met, in person, Sean Merrill, who said to us, welcome home. It was that point I felt my life was going to change. I felt God's community within my life. I was overwhelmed with God's love and understanding while I was there. On my way home, I talked to Dave Quinones. We discussed my past and getting to know Jesus and making him Lord of my life. I realized that I needed to forgive myself as well as others. Only forgiveness could set me free. At that moment, I wanted to look more towards Jesus. I now know Jesus has forgiven me. I've been attending BBC every Sunday since then, and I've been learning so much about Jesus. I've been clean for over two months. This is the time I've been clean of all my addictions since I was a teenager, one day at a time. Getting to know people at BBC is great. I love the church. The church has helped me in many ways. I feel like BBC is part of my family. I have been part of the men's Bible group as well as other support groups. Pastor Dave and Steve Chapman have been very instrumental in my recovery and helped me with my journey to fulfill a life. I've been looking forward to getting more involved with the church and helping others who have gone through the same as many of us have. This is my story. Hello, my name is Justin Lubinsky and I'd like to share my story with you. Ever since I was a child, I believed in Jesus Christ and God. We attended a Protestant church where I sang in the youth choir, and later in high school, it was the youth group. I believed in God, but that was as far as it went. A few years back, my wife, Naomi, had become a member of BBC. I would occasionally attend church. During these services, I would listen to the sermon, and in many cases, I could apply it to my life. I felt like God was speaking to me, but I knew there must be more. I wanted more, but wanting is never enough. A little less than a year ago, I lost my mom to a stroke. Losing someone is never easy. I just didn't know what to do, as I've become my father's caregiver now. There was a void in my life. I didn't know how to fix it, and I prayed and asked God what to do. No, really, I did. A day or so later, the phone rang. Some friends had made several meals for us and my family. It was at this point that I realized that God was truly there for me. I felt God's love in a new way. My prayer was being answered. The calls were coming in. What can we do? What do you need? How can we help? Can we watch the kids? Do you need food or transportation? The calls of love changed my heart. It was through handshakes, hugs, words of encouragement, and the prayers were incredible. I can see how God and his love are filling that void. God has become more real to me than I could have ever imagined. Now I want to learn to live and love the life of a good Christian and a follower of Jesus Christ. Thank you for allowing me to share my story. Hi, my name is Linda Hilton. Uh, let me tell you my story. As a child, I went to church because my mom and dad forced us to go to church. It really didn't mean anything to me at that time. As a teenager, I stopped going to church because it was a choice. A few years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer. I was devastated with the news. I went through chemo, radiation, then I became cancer free. Then my husband of 44 years passed away. I was devastated again. Shortly afterwards, the cancer returned. I was feeling alone. I was scared. I was very nervous about the future. I knew what was missing in my life. I was missing a relationship with Jesus. I got down on my knees. I prayed for forgiveness and for Jesus to be Lord over my life. I surrendered my life to Jesus. I realized that I need needed to move from self-centered 
always wanting control of everything in my life. I realized I needed to trust in Him. I felt deep peace and comfort over me. Today I still have good days and bad days. On my good days I feel like Jesus is walking by me and on my bad days I feel like Jesus is carrying me. Now I want to learn more about Jesus so that I, become, I can become more Christ-like. I trust in God for He knows what is best for me and He loves me so much. Praise the Lord. I love those stories. I get to hear those stories when we have new people. Um, and I just ask them, can you just share your stories? And I had them write down their stories because they were nervous about it being on video and so forth. But they did a great job. And it shows us and encourages us because we were once lost, but now we were found with Christ. So thank you, Justin. And we're going to see him in about five minutes being baptized. So that's point number two as Christians, we have a story. And point three is really going to be short, just to basically God wants to use you. Just, as, just because you accept Christ doesn't mean that everything is done. It's just the beginning. We're here to keep on walking, keep on growing in our faith. And for Saul, it was to continue the march and share and preach the good news throughout the Gentile world. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, for which God, prepared, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, once we accept Jesus Christ, He gives us the Holy Spirit, and He has good things for us to do. And some of those good things may involve sharing our story with our family, with a neighbor. You never know who God's going to bring your way. But it takes faith sometimes to share our stories about how Jesus has transformed us. And I want to let you know in point number three is just simply, God will use your story to touch more people than you ever realized. But have faith in sharing it. So to recap this morning, I want to let everybody know that as Christ follows, we all have a story. One, God never gives up on people, including you. Number two, each of us has a story basically proclaiming who Jesus is and how he's touched our life. And third, God wants to use you. He, will not, he wants to use you for his glory. Because when you get touched by Christ, you want to share it with others. So how do we apply this to our life? What is the application for this? For some of us this morning, this may be new news. Maybe this is the first time you heard about this guy named Jesus. Or maybe you've been coming here for a while and you really have never accepted Jesus in your heart. My question to you is, why not? Why not? Ask Jesus into your life. Because Jesus can forgive you of your sins. And he can fill the void that we so much fill it with so many other things. So for you this morning, I ask you, I plead with you, but to ask Jesus into your heart. Now some of us, we've been asked Jesus in our heart a long time ago. For you, your challenge is simply is to get involved in a small group. Join Starting Point is a great way to start, but to grow and take the next step in your faith. Starting Point is going to be on Wednesday nights here at the church at 7 p.m. Come to it. It's a wonderful class. It lasts for eight weeks. And for some of you, you're growing in your faith, but my challenge to you is to share your story. Share what Jesus has done for you. You won't regret it. Because I believe that's how God touches people one life at a time, is through stories. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you, and I give you thanks, Lord, for saving us. Because, Lord, we needed your forgiveness. We needed, Lord, you to touch us in our life. And I pray, Lord, for those people in this room that maybe have never have accepted you. I pray, Lord, that they will give their lives over to you. That they will seek you out. 
For some of us in this room, Lord, we need to be challenged with taking the next step in our faith. Lord, help us to join a class like Starting Point. Help us to join a small group to help us grow in our faith. Lord, because we need to be challenged. Coming on Sunday morning is not enough, Lord, but we need to start reading our Bibles, start praying to you. And Lord, as you bring new people into our way, Lord, help us to share our story with the people, Lord, that you need to be touched. And we pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.